Okay, take it away, Katie. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here um, again to hear me talk about one of my favorite subjects, vultures. Um, last time when I spoke to you about uh, cerulean warblers, you know, vultures, people often ask me, you know, how did you go from um, talking, you know, writing about the cerulean warbler, you know, a small, very beautiful, uh, declining songbird, to then writing about, you know, vultures, um, turkey vultures specifically, you know, large, um, maybe not as cute as cerulean warblers, and probably um, increasing in number, not declining. And I'm not sure how I really uh, made that jump, but but I actually started to write about vultures first. Um, when I was first getting started volunteering in wildlife rehab centers, I was always fascinated by the vultures. When they would come in injured, there was just something different and really neat about them. So um, I started writing a book about them, and then the cerulean warbler subject just sort of seemed to be more immediate and more pressing. So I kind of tabled vultures and wrote about cerulean warblers. And then I went back to vultures <laughs> and uh, I talk about them, you know, all the time. So um, the title of my of my book is Vulture, the Private Life of an Unloved Bird. Uh, but they aren't really unloved. Vultures really do have a lot of fans and a lot of people who appreciate them. Uh, this particular picture here was taken at Boyce Thompson Arboretum State Park, which is in Superior, Arizona. And if any of you have ever gone birding um, at Boyce Thompson Arboretum, um, it's a really wonderful place to go birding. It's about an hour from Phoenix. And they have not one, but two vulture festivals every year. They have a Bye Bye Buzzards Festival in September and a Welcome Back Buzzards Festival in March. Um, even though they do have some vultures all year uh, in the Phoenix area, they have more of them. <laughs> Um, in the in the summer, and I'll talk about migration in a couple minutes. Um, while I'm while I mentioned buzzards, something interesting to kind of point out when we get started is that the word buzzard is a word that comes from Europe, and it's used to describe hawks in the Buteo family. So if you are in the UK, you would call a red-tailed hawk a red-tailed buzzard, and people aren't exactly sure why we started calling vultures in the new world uh, buzzards, but the idea is that when people from Europe maybe came to North America and saw these big birds in the sky, they called them buzzards because that's what they would have been um, in Europe. But no one knows for sure, but the, uh, you know, it's correct to call them vultures, but anyway. Um, so they're not really unloved. There are a lot of vulture festivals around and alternate titles for this book uh, except for, you know, besides vulture, private life of an unloved bird, we thought about uh, vulture, eat your heart out, you know, or, or, um, you know, vulture, happy entrails to you. <laughs> but, but we didn't get that. There, there are an awful lot of vulture puns and funny vulture comics. When people know you like them, everybody sends them to me and it's really, it's really, really fun. Okay. So getting ahead of myself. Uh, so this is what the cover of the book looks like. It used, the first edition had a purple cover. So if you got, the first edition came out in 2017 and it had a nice purple, purple cover. And then a really terrible thing happened. The publisher went out of business who published the first version of the book. It was University Press of New England, kind of a big publisher to go out of business. But happily, the book was republished by the University of Brandeis, Brandeis University Press. And they gave it this um, beautiful, uh, beautiful full color cover and there's full color photographs in it now. And that new edition came out in 2020, right when everything was shutting down, <laughs> which is a great time to try to promote a book. But um, anyway, this is what the, the cover of the new version, new version looks like. So before we talk specifically about turkey vultures, let's talk a little bit about vultures, kind of the big picture of vultures around the world. So worldwide, vultures are primarily scavengers. So no matter where you are in the world, if there's a bird called a vulture, it's 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 primarily a scavenger. Although they do eat uh, some different kinds of animals that they scavenge. Some vultures eat more non-animal material than others, but most of them are scavengers around the world. Uh, 
vultures worldwide have a strong stomach acid and a lot of beneficial bacteria in their guts to allow them to eat and neutralize diseases like rabies, anthrax, um, botulism, toxin, a lot of others. So if an animal has died from, you know, anthrax, for example, the vultures can eat that, eat that animal and not feel the, uh, and not be adversely affected by the disease. And then when they go to the bathroom, there aren't any traces of those diseases anymore in their, in their droppings. And usually the, even the DNA of what they ate is, has been just fried and is not, there's not a trace of it in the droppings. So if you need to get rid of a body ever, you know, vulture, <laughs> give it to a are pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good at that job. Um, and this is just a really cool um, quote from, from someone who studies, did some research on the different kinds of bacteria that are in turkey vulture guts. Uh, he says their, their stomachs are extremely harsh environments, frying everything that passes through. Even the prey DNA does not pass through. Um, and I just think that's really, really pretty incredible. Uh, vultures efficiently remove carcasses. So they're, they're really fast at eating carcasses. Um, they kind of, they, they, they take care of them pretty quickly, faster than mammals. Um, and if these carcasses were kind of lying around for a long time, they could contaminate, you know, the water or the soil. Um, and vultures efficiently remove them. And they also can reduce the concentration and the number of mammals around a carcass. So this is important because mammals all sitting around a carcass, um, you know, biting each other, swapping saliva is is how rabies is often spread. And no one wants to get rabies, right? It's it's um it's very bad. And having, uh, you know, vultures efficiently removing these carcasses can can kind of stop so many mammals from standing around around a carcass eating together and spreading rabies. So they're they are good for ecosystem health um, in a lot of ways. So these are these these really nice pictures that I have here are not pictures that I took myself. Um, I'll let you know the ones I took myself are definitely not as nice as these. But this is a this is um. Amazing, an amazing vulture. Hopefully everyone knows what this is, right? California condor, right? Um, and this is our critically endangered vulture that we have here in North America. There are only our, um, you know, I think there are only about 530 or so condors. And I just, I don't know if you've heard this, but I just read the other day, the terrible news that um, highly pathogenic avian influenza has killed at least 18 California condors over the last few weeks, um, which is really tragic um, for this critically endangered species. And this vulture is another, another new world vulture. If you, if you have been to the tropics, Costa Rica or South America, uh, Central or South America, I should say, you may have seen this beautiful guy. This is a king vulture. People often think that vultures are really ugly. And then I think about a bird like a king vulture. It's, it's my, I mean, it's strange looking, yes, but it's certainly not, you know, this kind of big, ugly bird that we would, we normally think of. And this is one of my favorite vulture species. This is the bearded vulture. And its diet is mostly bones and a uh, bone marrow. And if you can, if you look at this picture, that's a, a leg bone of some uh, little hoofed animal <laughs> uh, in its beak. And bearded vultures will actually take a bone like this and fly up above rocks and then drop it. So the bone breaks open to allow them to eat the bone marrow on the inside, which is uh, is pretty neat. And this is a species that lives in parts of Europe, um, parts of Africa, and parts of Asia. And I believe there there are they are not a species um, commonly kept in captivity or under human care. I only know of one in the United States um, at a place in Missouri, uh, but they are very large, um, very very interesting, intimidating bird. And this is the griffin vulture. Um, this is a, uh, another large um, old world species. And if, you, if you've ever heard of the Tibetan sky burials where vultures um, eat, uh, eat dead people as sort of, it's seen by the um, certain groups as a final act of charity. And this is the species that, uh, one of the species that often helps out with that. If you go to YouTube and look up Tibetan sky burials, you can see 
um, some videos of this, but it's a little bit, you know, it's the content warning. <laughs> so don't, don't watch that if you don't want to see it, but it's uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing. And this, another one of my favorite vulture species is the lappet faced vulture, one of the large species in Africa. Um, recently, recently listed, I, I, or uplisted, I guess you'd say, I think as, as critically endangered. And it's one of the uh, very large species with that really sharp hooked beak. So if you, if you look at that guy's beak for a second, uh, and then you, well, I have pictures of turkey vultures in a minute, lots of pictures of turkey vultures, but the beak shape of a lappet faced vulture and a new world vulture, like a turkey vulture is very different. Um, most people agree that old world vultures, so vultures in, actually, this is, um, I'm talking about this on the next slide, the, the vulture species from Africa, Asia, and Europe, most people agree that those species uh, share a common ancestor with hawks and eagles, and the seven species in North and South America may also have a, a share a common ancestor with hawks and eagles, but it was um, back further than the old world species. We traditionally group new world vultures with raptors because they kind of look the same. And then in the 1990s, they moved them into storks. Uh, they moved the vulture family into the stork family. And then uh, in early 2000s, maybe 2010 or so, they moved them back to raptors. Uh, so new world vultures are just, they're, we, we've had debates about how to categorize them for a while, but now they're back with raptors again. But they're not very closely related to the old world vultures, even though they do the same job in the ecosystem. So of the 23 species, um, the 16 in Africa, seven in North America, 11 of those 16 African and Eurasian vultures are endangered and eight are considered critically endangered. And here in North America, we have, you know, the one, the California condor that's critically endangered. In general, our, our uh, new world species are doing better than the than vultures in the old world but uh, no matter where they are in the world poisoning is is probably the biggest threat to vultures worldwide um habitat loss of course is a, is a problem also but poisoning um affects vultures uh for a lot of reasons um one one big reason is that they scavenge so if an animal has been uh, another a large mammal has been poisoned and dies and vultures come to scavenge on it, they could get sick and die also from the same poison. And this happens is happening in Africa um, more and more often when animals like elephants or rhinos are poached, are, are killed. Sometimes the poachers will poison the carcass. So if the vultures land on the carcass and eat it, they will die instead of swirling around, you know, in the sky above the carcass, you know, alerting authorities. So it's a, um, it's a big problem. Sometimes uh, vultures are also in, especially in Southern Africa and Western Africa are kind of taken for sort of superstitious or religious reasons. There's the belief that uh, having the head of a vulture can be good luck um, or can keep you healthy. And you can buy these things on the streets in some countries, um, some African countries, heads of vultures. Uh, and this is also something that has gone up during COVID. There was the belief that having a vulture head would would uh, keep you safe from COVID, um, which is kind of an interesting kind of kind of an interesting belief. So now we get to our friends, the turkey vultures. Uh, it's probably the world's most widespread, or it's, it is the world's most widespread, but it's pro and probably the most numerous or the most abundant vulture. There's one other vulture species that could be more abundant, um, could be more numerous than the turkey vulture, and that would be the black vulture. Um, whichever one um, is more numerous, we, we have a lot of both species. There are probably um, 15 to 20 million individual turkey vultures and just about as many black vultures worldwide. Turkey vultures have a bigger range. They breed from southern Canada, uh, it's really central Canada, to the tip of Argentina, and almost everywhere in between has turkey vultures. Different habitats, they're in mountains, they're in forests, they're in deserts, um, coastlines. Uh, they really are um, a species that is that 
has adapted very well to live in all different kinds of places. They're on islands also. They're on the in the Caribbean islands, the Falkland Islands, um, and they do they do pretty well wherever wherever they are. There are six subspecies of turkey vulture, three that breed in North America and three that breed in the tropics. And to come back a minute to that 20 million individual turkey vultures number, if you think about cerulean warblers, my other kind of favorite species, there may only be 300,000 cerulean warblers in the world. So compare that to 20 million turkey vultures, you know, that's a lot of birds. So they're doing, doing quite well. Uh, different populations of turkey vultures have different migratory strategies. Some are uh, some are non-migratory. Some are complete migrants, like broadwing hawks. So they all leave um, and then they all come back. And some are partially migrant. And where you are in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania and where I am in north central West Virginia, we can see turkey vultures all year, even though they're going to be more abundant in the summertime. We're kind of at that area where we're kind of at the northern end of where they are all year. So this map um, is, is from uh, Birds of the World using eBird data. And you can see that, you know, the red on North America is where turkey vultures are only found in the, in the breeding season in the summer. Purple is where they are all year. Uh, and as you can see, they are they are very concentrated in Central America all year, and the southeastern United States. About seventy percent of turkey vultures live in the tropics, and about only about thirty percent live in North America. So while we have a lot here, there are even more um, further south. And turkey vultures are a species too that is kind of showing up further and further north. Um, Christmas bird counts and stuff like that. They're kind of getting showing up more and more in more and more northern areas and so are black vultures and someone before the meeting mentioned the white ibis that was seen um, all the white ibises that were seen recently in your area and that's a species that seems to be or is you know showing up further and further north um also uh and it's kind of um Kind of interesting that turkey vultures and black vultures both kind of remind me of ibis in a lot of ways which people think is strange but uh they move the same um anyway I'll, I'll i can come i'll talk more about black vultures in a couple minutes but this is the view most of us get of a turkey vulture right if we are on the ground bird watching and we're looking up it's a bird that's you know often mistaken for eagles uh people will sometimes say to me you know oh katie i know you like birds i saw seven or eight golden eagles all circling together in the sky. It was amazing. Uh, and I will say, oh, that's probably turkey vultures. No, 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 Katie, these were beautiful birds. They weren't turkey vultures. <laughs> but, but really, I don't think that anything flies quite as beautifully as a turkey vulture. And of course, the undersides of those wings and tails are light and that tail is relatively long and thin. Um, and you can remember turkey vultures have silver linings which is a, a great way. If you see a big bird in the sky, you want to know what you're looking at. The the silver all the way underneath the wings like that um, is a great uh, a great way to tell. Black vultures look like they have white hands on the ends of their wings, and California condors. If you happen to get one, show up where you are, <laughs> or if you're out west looking, um, California condors are of course a lot bigger, and they look like they're wearing deodorant. They have like white marks underneath their their wing pits. So all three of our North American vultures uh, look pretty different once you know what to look for from below. This is um, up close. Uh, at the beginning of the presentation, we mentioned that um, I'm, I work with an organization called the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, which is a very long name. We usually just say ACCA. And we spend a lot of our time doing rehab of wild birds. And we also have several non-releasable birds that we do educational presentations with. And this um, very handsome turkey vulture is named Lou. And Lou was hit by a car and unfortunately is unable to fly well enough to return to the wild, but he makes a great subject for um, photographs, <laughs> especially for presentations like this. So in the East, our turkey vultures weigh about four pounds the subspecies in the west and the upper west is a little bit bigger than, than the eastern subspecies and the subspecies in the southwest is a little bit smaller. 
Uh, our eastern subspecies has about a five to six foot wingspan, so very similar to a bald eagle, but it weighs less than half of what a bald eagle weighs. And a turkey vulture is just not um, equipped with feet like, a, like an eagle or a hawk. They have these kind of chicken feet. You can see Lou standing there. They're kind of big, flat feet. They're, they're not good for uh, grabbing anything and carrying it away. And you, you can notice, um, I don't know if I, if I will be able to point on my slide, but the, you can kind of see sort of on the left side of his foot, there's this little tiny toe. It looks like a pinky toe almost. And that's, that's the back toe of a turkey vulture, the, uh, the halix. On, a, on an eagle, that halix is huge, curved, very, very powerful. Uh, we, don't, we can't ethically really release uh, a raptor back to the wild if they're missing that halix, that big, strong halix, because it's so important for grabbing prey. And turkey vultures don't even really have one. <laughs> so it's, it's really like their pinky toe. So vultures get blamed for all kinds of things. Uh, but if when someone says, you know, a turkey vulture carried away my golden retriever, um, it is not it is not something that they are physically capable of doing. They just don't have a, a toe that can carry anything. Uh, they can drag dead things with their beaks. So if they want to drag a dead rabbit to a better place for them to eat it, they can drag it with their beaks, but they're not going to be carrying anything in their feet. Speaking of beaks. Look at how cute this guy's face is, right? It's a, it's a, <laughs> this is a, this is a turkey vulture who was hit by a car. And um, it's sort of an interesting story. Someone came around a corner and there were vultures feeding on the road and he bumped one of them with a truck, pickup truck actually. And he stopped, but he didn't see it. So he figured it flew away. Then he got home and discovered that the bird was actually, uh, actually, no, I told the story wrong. He got home from work, went to bed, got up the next morning and went out to his truck and the bird was standing in the back of it. Uh, and he didn't know what to do. So he squirted it with a hose because what else would you do? I guess he squirted it with a hose to get the bird out of his truck, went to work, came back from work and the bird was still still in his yard. So he posted it on Facebook and tracked us down and eventually we got this bird and he wasn't badly injured and after a few weeks of just recovering from soft tissue injuries uh, we were able to release him but if we look at this face up close we can you know we can identify some of the really key features of what makes a turkey vulture awesome first um, if I were doing this you know live in the room I would say you know what do you notice about his face so, so you notice his nose, right? That's almost what everybody says first is they notice those nostrils, these big nostrils on the top of the nose that you can look right through one side out the other, like it should have a ring in there, right? Um, and turkey vultures have an excellent sense of smell and the, the sense of smell um, and how birds use it is not very well understood in most bird species, but we do know that turkey vultures use that excellent sense of smell to find their food. They also have excellent eyesight that they can, that they can use to find food, um, but that sense of smell is very keen. And other species will often follow turkey vultures uh, to food and then sometimes displace them at carcasses. So black vultures, eagles, even ravens, um, and California condors in the West will chase uh, chase turkey vultures away from carcasses pretty often because turkey vultures are a lot less powerful than some of those bigger birds. So they use that sense of smell and their excellent eyesight. Uh, they also use this very sharp hooked beak to tear chunks off the food and swallow it. And if you look at this bird's mouth, you can tell it's got a very big, it's got a very, uh, a mouth that can open very wide. It can really get this mouth open wide to swallow big chunks, um, big chunks of food. They use, if you look really closely at, my, at the screen and you, you can look at the tongue, sort of the back of the tongue, you can see serrated edges, sort of like a saw blade. And a turkey vulture uses that serrated tongue to help them swallow like slippery, <laughs> slippery stuff like entrails and organs. Uh, it's, you know, they don't have teeth in there, but that, that tongue can kind of help them hold on to food and, and get it swallowed. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, 
Also, there's not many feathers on this face, right? Turkey vultures don't have a lot of, a lot of feathers on their face. Um, the idea is that this is to keep their faces clean. If they're sticking their head way into a carcass to get, to get the good stuff out, um, you know, they don't want to have, they can't preen their faces. So they don't want to have all that stuck on their faces. Uh, it also can possibly serve, help with them. Um, temperature regulation. And some people have suggested that the uh, skin color of a vulture's face, um, turkey vultures, as well as California condors, uh, can, you know, they can kind of blush. Their faces can become very flushed or very pale, sort of depending on, I mean, mood is probably not the right word, but depending on what they want to communicate to other vultures. So what else about this face have I not mentioned? Um, people, you know, again, will say, you like those really ugly birds, um, you know, and I say, they're, they're, they're bald, they're really ugly, and I say, yeah, but if they had, what if they weren't bald, and they stuck their faces into carcasses, and they had pieces of rotten deer, you know, stuck all over their faces, like, how ugly would they be then, right? <laughs> that would be a lot worse. So someone, sometimes, often in presentations, people ask, well, what is that, what are those white things on their faces, those white, wart, warty things? So I don't have a great answer for that. And I, I, I really want to figure out what they are. I mean, they, they look and feel like warts. Interestingly, though, the turkey vultures in the tropics, so the three subspecies that live in the tropics don't have them, don't have the warts on there, don't develop the warts on their faces. And it's not something the birds are born with. So, you know, when turkey vultures hatch, they don't get these warty things on their faces. And... Uh, one of our captive turkey vultures, this is uh, Boris, very and a very elegant lady turkey vulture, uh, who the finder named her Boris, um, and then it stuck by the time we did DNA, DNA sexing to determine if it, the bird was male or female, uh, which you kind of, that's really the only reliable way to tell if a turkey vulture is male or female size is not a very good indication. You have to really do a blood test. We've had Boris since she was about one year old, or maybe even before she was one year old. And she is uh, seven years old now, and she has never developed any of those warts on her face. And Lou, uh, the turkey vulture that we saw a slide or two ago, also, also came in when he was about a year old, and he doesn't have them on his face either. So uh, I don't know if this if these are potentially caused by you know something in the environment that they're getting you know uh, warts are often caused by a virus uh, if it's if it's um something they're getting on their faces from what they're eating and it and it turns into warts I don't I don't know I don't have a great answer but I would love to figure out figure out what that is okay so look how pretty Boris is again just a really beautiful beautiful bird Boris is also not really sticking her head into any carcasses at the ACCA she eats mostly mostly rats, which are kind of boring and nice, uh, but she also gets quail, um, chicks, and occasionally fish. Uh, and she will, she will sometimes, when, when we're really lucky, she will get uh, deer, pieces of deer that have been killed with, during archery season. We only feed uh, our birds deer that have been killed with a, with a bow. Uh, we don't feed any of our birds deer that have been shot with lead, am lead ammunition because of the potential for lead poisoning, which I'll get to in a, in a, in a minute or two here. <laughs> but turkey vultures are, um, I think I've already mentioned this, but they are obligate scavengers. So they are, they are considered birds that, you know, scavenge for a living. Um, they're not equipped to kill anything. Their diet is, is carrion, so dead stuff. There have been a few instances where turkey vultures have been documented to, to eat live prey, but they are very few and far between. And if it ever happens, you know, it's, it should be reported to, you know, to someone because they're the Journal of Raptor Research, because it's very, very rare. Um, the things they have been documented to eat are, um, eat live, are invertebrates. So uh, Boris will eat mealworms that are alive. Um, small, you know, small things like that, insects um, that they might find on the ground, uh, fish, small fish that have washed up on a beach that aren't quite dead yet that they can walk over and just swallow, um, little little turtle hatchlings that that also similarly they can just walk up to and swallow, 
uh, they aren't able, they don't, aren't really equipped to kill anything with their, with their feet or their beaks. They mostly can just walk, they can, but they can walk up to something that's really small and swallow it <laughs> if it can't move that fast. But uh, obli they are considered by obligate scavengers only eating dead stuff. Um, they do sometimes though, seem to learn where reliable sources of carrion occur and maybe you know ha congregate in those areas like if there's a section of the road where where possibly um animals get hit often or if the doh disposes of of uh, white-tailed deer carcasses you know you in pennsylvania and us in west virginia like we have a lot of deer carcasses <laughs> and if they all kind of get disposed of in the same place the vultures can learn you know learn where that happens um, mm -hmm. and hang out there uh, this is another one of my awesome favorite comics. This is um, uh, from Bird and Moon is the uh, the artist of this. I am a turkey vulture. Yes, indeed. My head is bare to prevent rotting flesh from adhering to it. I didn't talk about this yet, but to keep cool, I poop on my legs and feet, which there's an actual uh, word for this. And it is uh, urohydrosis. We usually call it an accident if it happens in my house. Um, I have I have three three kids under age 10. Um, but your urohydrosis is it's it's not even really the the poop it's the liquid waste that they expel onto their legs and feet, and I had a really some really interesting conversations with uh, the editor of my book trying to figure out how to best describe it. Um, the editor said just call it urine, and I said well it's not urine it's um birds don't there's not really you know there's urates, um, and there's some urea in there but calling it urine is not quite right and and. And she didn't like saying they go to the bathroom on their legs. And we went with expel liquid waste as the appropriate phrase. <laughs> but other species do this also. California condors do it. Black vultures do it. And a lot of storks do it also. Uh, my main defense is projectile vomiting. Um, and this is an interesting, interesting defense mechanism that is pretty effective if you are uh, bothering baby turkey vultures in a nest, for example, which is where they are probably most vulnerable. There's not much that really eats turkey vultures other than the babies in the nest. And I will show you where they nest right now. So turkey vultures don't don't build official nests. Um, they don't. They can't carry anything with their feet to build a nest, um, and they they don't they don't really bring stuff to the nest, but they will. When they find an appropriate cave or a cliff or an abandoned structure, they may kind of move some of the some of the uh, sticks or leaves around, but they don't really build anything. So this particular turkey vulture nest is in a cave in uh, western Pennsylvania, uh, in Avella, Pennsylvania, and you have to have a permit, of course, to go in and. Um, bother or sample or anything, baby turkey vultures in a nest. So our my small organization, the ACCA, partners with um, Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania and the USGS and West Virginia University. And we go into known vulture nests in the summertime. And we uh, take samples, blood samples from any chicks that we find to test for lead poisoning. And we also take you know, measurements and if the birds are old enough, we put wing tags on them as well. So these are turkey vultures in Claysville, Pennsylvania in a hayloft. And again, there's no nests made. They're just wandering around in a hayloft. And once the babies are old enough that they don't need uh, to be brooded, they don't need the, the parents to sit on them and keep them warm anymore. They're just kind of up there wandering around and the parents only visit for a few minutes at a time to feed them. And how are they feeding them, right? We have, we, when we think of raptors feeding their chicks, you know, we conjure up these dramatic images of like the bald eagle flying with a fish and dropping it in the nest. Well, with turkey vultures, they're fed entirely by regurgitation from the parents the entire time they're in the nest. The parent vultures will go out and, you know, eat, eat the roadkill and then come back, throw it up for the babies who then eat it. So baby turkey vulture vomit is much worse <laughs> in my opinion, than adult turkey vulture vomit because it's sort of twice partially digested carrion. So 
if you look on the lower kind of lower bottom right hand corner of the screen those little red brown lumps are vomit that was uh, meant for me <laughs> kind of vomited in my general direction um and if you this this works as a defense because it can deter some predators like some predators would would smell that and see that and and leave like that's what a regular human would do um, and other predators like a coyote or a raccoon or something that might come upon a turkey vulture nest may even eat that instead of bothering the baby turkey vulture. Um, I have a beagle and I think that she would definitely eat that if given the chance. That's, you know, partially digested roadkill sounds just like a treat for her. So, so, um, Oh, I'm glad I put these words up to remind me. So turkey vultures have two eggs a year. So it's kind of amazing that they only nest once a year. It's amazing we have so many turkey vultures in the world <laughs> and they really only have one nest a year with two babies. And turkey vultures are, there's some debate about when turkey vultures first start to breed at what age. Most people seem to agree it's around five years old, um, but there's again, some, some, uh, some discussion about when the breeding age actually occurs, but it's not right away. It's not within the first couple of years of life. And again, they only have uh, one nest a year, almost always with two eggs. Both parents share the duties equally of incubating the eggs. They will switch off. Uh, the male will sit on the sit on the eggs for you know twelve hours or so, and then the female will come and take over. And the other the the other partner will go to a communal roost. Um, and it's uh, it's kind of kind of like it. It's a good system. And both parents will feed the babies also. And then after about a month, the eggs hatch, which is pretty standard for most many bird species, um, many large raptors. After about a month, the eggs hatch. But these babies are in there for quite a while. They're in there for about two more months, uh, about 60 days before they leave the nest. And then they hang out around the nest for another another few weeks. And it's, it's not usually until they're 84 days or so old that they actually fully fledge and leave the nest site and go to a, a communal roost. They follow other vultures to the roost. Um, and once they're at that roost, uh, they aren't supported anymore by the parents. So the parents are like, great, we're all together now in the big, the big roost and y'all are on your own. Um, it's a little bit different with black vultures. Black vultures will also kind of take their young to a communal roost, but black vultures tend to roost with extended family members. So a lot of the black vulture roosts, the birds will be related somehow, which is pretty interesting um, research that was done on that. And the parents will continue to feed their young birds for months and months, even into the winter. Uh, but turkey vultures are like, yeah, you know, we're done with that. Let's, um, you know, done with the babies. Let's all go to the communal roost. And up close, hopefully everyone watching just went, oh, because look how cute that face is, that baby turkey vulture. It's a, a lot different from the adult. The, the skin is gray. That skin doesn't really turn red until the birds are at least a year old or even a little bit older. The beak doesn't get white on the end until, again, until they're a year old or older. And the eyes turn from this beautiful blue color to that kind of stony brown color um, as they get older also. And somebody at a, at a presentation once said that, this looks like Bernie Sanders. And now that, now I can't, I can't unsee it now every time I see this slide. Uh, interesting to note too about turkey vultures, they have white down feathers, kind of bright white down feathers. And I don't have a picture of a black vulture chick, but they have kind of brownish buffy down feathers. And they can be extremely difficult to tell apart when they're babies um, in a nest. But if you've got kind of tannish fluffy chicks, that's a black vulture. If you've got white fluffy chicks, it's a turkey vulture. So I mentioned what we're doing in these nests. In these nests, we are um, taking the babies out, they're only out of the nest for about 15 minutes. We usually don't even see the parents at all. The babies are just in there. Um, we're doing, we're part of, uh, again, a larger research project that looks at contaminants, specifically lead. Um, also migration, trying to get a sense of, you know, where the birds show up if people see them with the wing tags um, and population size. And this, this picture is showing, you know, the baby in the baby scale. So we take weight and we get 
other measurements. And then that little box behind the scale is the lead care kit. So we can take a blood sample in the field and run it in the lead care system. And we can know within a minute or two if the bird is suffering from lead poisoning or not. And lead poisoning is like its own, you know, day long symposium. Uh, but the short, the short story on lead is that the birds are likely getting it from eating a carcass that has little bits of spent ammunition in it. So if you shoot a white-tailed deer and a bullet fragments, and then you field dress, you know, like gut, leave a gut pile in the woods. If you're a scavenger and you come upon a white-tailed deer gut pile, that's amazing, awesome. <laughs> like the big predator has come through and killed a deer. And then the scavenger gets to come and eat it and doesn't even have to get through any tough hide or anything. It's just a pile of guts. Like that's fabulous if you're a vulture. But uh, if there are little pieces of lead in the in the gut pile and the vultures, you know, inadvertently swallow them, they can become sick. Turkey vultures, however, can handle a lot of lead and not show any clinical signs. So they can be kind of a good species to study to get a sense of how much lead is out there in what they're eating. California condors, um, lead toxicity is a, a big hurdle for their recovery. Um, bald eagles um, only need to eat a piece of lead about the size of a grain of rice uh, to, to get very, very sick or die. Um, but turkey vultures can handle um, quite a bit more lead. But again, lead the lead story is its sort of own, own presentation. But if you're interested in reading more about it, if you, if you Google, on the bottom of this is a paper that we were a part of. Um, chronic lead exposure is epidemic and obligate scavenger populations in Eastern North America. That's where um, researchers looked at about 100 dead turkey vultures and black vultures and did, um, did analyses on the lead deposition in bones and also analyzed the, I don't understand the science necessarily, but analyzed the isotopic fingerprint of the lead that was in the bones and they, they determined that 100% um, of the vultures that they studied showed evidence of chronic lead exposure and that the lead was mostly from spent ammunition and coal-fired power plant emissions. Those were the two biggest sources of, of uh, lead in the bird's bones. Anyway, that's you should check out that paper. And there's also a West Virginia public broadcasting story about it where you can listen to my husband <laughs> getting interviewed. Um, he's a veterinarian who takes care of all these birds. Uh, this is just some of the, what we do when we do some of the sampling. Again, the birds always uh, look very, it's got to be like getting abducted by aliens. Um, it's a really strange experience, especially if you've been in a cave and have never been in the sunlight before. Those are my kids helping. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, I make them take, take notes. So, uh, you know, I don't think they realize that not all kids, not all, you know, not all parents make their kids take vulture notes during blood draws, but whatever. <laughs> um, and then uh, also taking measurements of the of the beak um, and then the wing cord and the legs. So we record all these measurements um, and give them to the bird banding, federal bird banding lab. And then we also put a wing tag on the birds with a number. And these are wing tag, the same wing tags that Hawk Mountain uses, which is not too far from where you all are. Um, and uh, each wing tag has a unique number, and this allows people on the ground who are bird watching to identify the number and then report it to the bird banding lab, and then we can learn about movement and where the birds where the birds um, are going. So when I first saw these tags, uh, I was talking with um, Keith Keith Bildstein, who was retired from Hawk Mountain, and he also has an, actually an excellent book about vultures called Vultures of the World that came out a couple of years ago that tells you all about vultures all over the world. And it's, um, you know, a, sci a science book, but it's, re it's really wonderful. Anyway, I, I um, told uh, Dr. Bildstein that I was, <laughs> when I saw the wing tags that I was a little worried, they looked kind of big and, you know, I'm a vulture hugger and I wasn't sure that these tags would hurt the vultures or not or impede flight. And he said that these are the same kind of tags they use on California condors. And before they put them on any California condors, they tested them extensively on turkey vultures um, and determined that they were safe. So uh, I guess I'm mostly convinced. <laughs> but um, 
our tags, we don't we don't get recitings very often, but we've had four or five since we started the project about 10 years ago. This is Vulture 285, and he was tagged, he or she was tagged in um, 2016 in Avella, Pennsylvania. And this is a bird that was recited in West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, just a few months, not even a year later. So before the bird was a year old, it had gone all the way to West Palm Beach. Um, and uh, we were able to get in touch with the person who reported the tag um, and find out more about where the bird, what the bird was doing. Um, I said, you know, I asked, you know, was it at Mar-a-Lago? Um, but it was not. It was it was uh, at in a wildlife management area feeding um, in a swamp with uh, a lot of other turkey vultures. And the only thing that stood out about this one was that it had a wing tag. And very exciting news. I don't have it in this presentation yet because it literally just happened. One of our vultures was uh, one of our tagged vultures was caught on a on a trail camera feeding on a dead cow. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful picture of the bird standing on the dead cow with its wings out and you could see the wing tag very plainly. And it was a bird that we tagged in 2017 that was just caught, you know, in March of 2023 on the trail cam. So that's that's uh, very close to where we tagged it. So that's interesting also. Um, another way to learn about turkey vulture movements. Oh, I should mention if I go back to this West Palm Beach slide for a second, our Eastern birds, um, this is as, about as far as they will go. They're considered, again, partial migrants. Some stay around in Virginia, North Carolina all year. Um, some of them head to Miami or Orlando, uh, but but they don't. Our, our eastern birds don't join that big river of raptors um, in Veracruz, and they don't go to South America. Other turkey vultures do, but not not our eastern turkey vultures. So a lot of the the, the um, information we have about turkey vulture movement is from um, wearing transmitters, and you can see that this guy's got a transmitter or she, I should say, this this lady has a turkey, has a transmitter. It's a little backpack. And it's it's a very similar transmitter to the kind that Hawk Mountain puts on puts on turkey vultures that they monitor. Uh, this is the only turkey vulture from West Virginia wearing a transmitter that I know of. This is a bird that uh, the transmitter was donated to us. They usually cost several four or five thousand dollars, but this one was donated. Um, this is a bird that was shot in the uh, Tucker County, West Virginia, and when we released her, she still had some shotgun pellets that would have caused more damage to remove than just to leave in her for when we released her. So we we released this bird, and we did this very dramatic release where we sort of were hoping she would, <laughs> we would like open the carrier and she would fly off over the overlook at the state forest, and instead she flew about 10 feet and landed on the railing. <laughs> which was fine and then it, she looked around for a while and then she flew away but it, it um, made for a great photo opportunity so this bird this is um the map of where she went so the map on the left the sort of skinny map the star is where she was released and you can see that she went all the way to northern georgia and then back and then all the way to northern georgia again and then back we haven't had any uh, data from this bird since the end of since the late fall of 2016. Uh, so she could be dead, um, but she also could be could still be out there because um, again I don't understand the technology, but apparently her transmitter pings whenever it goes by a cell phone tower. And in 2016 uh, or 2017, maybe early 2017, AT and T shut down their 2G cell towers and that she has sort of a transmitter that would have worked with those cell towers so she has like an old cell phone i guess that that isn't pinging the, pinging the towers anymore you know the other vultures are shaming her maybe but uh so she could still be out there but even even if not that's a pretty pretty amazing to see her going to that same same place in the fall and then when she came back in the uh, spring, she did not come back to where she was released. She went back to Tucker County where she had been uh, had been shot. So she showed sight fidelity sort of at both ends of where she where she uh, migrated. So this map is one of Hawk Mountain's birds. That this is one of the northernmost nests, turkey vulture nests that we know of. It's in Leoville, Saskatchewan. 
And this is a bird wearing a transmitter. Uh, her name is Leo, and they put that transmitter on her in 2007. And as far as I know, um, this bird is still transmitting, is still out there. And her mate also wears a transmitter. Um, they had to recapture her maybe a year or two ago and fix her transmitter and then release her again. So this is a bird from the subspecies, the upper western subspecies, that's Cathartes ara meridionalis. And these birds are complete migrants that all leave the upper west and the upper midwest to go to central, uh, through Central America, all the way to South America. So these are the, this is the subspecies passing through um, Veracruz and that river of raptors. And what's really interesting, turkey vultures are strong pair bonders that, that mate for life, you know, or mate until one of the pair dies, and then they might find a new mate, but, but the pair will stay together as long as they're both al alive. Uh, Leo has had the same mate since 2007, but they go separate places in the winter. Uh, she goes into Venezuela and he goes further into Colombia, further south into Colombia, but then they come back to the same abandoned farmhouse in Saskatchewan to have their nest, but they have sort of like separate winter vacations, um, which could be why they're together, you know, all these years, right? They're, they're going, going somewhere else for the entire winter. Uh, this this is this map I wanted to show you quickly. This is that the third subspecies that we have in North America. This is the southwestern subspecies, uh, a little bit smaller than the eastern and the upper western birds, and they are considered a partial migrant, just like just like the eastern birds are. Some of them stay in Arizona all year. Some of them go into Mexico. But as far as we know, uh, this subspecies doesn't cross the Panama Canal. They just go from. Uh, the southwest, further southwest, or they or they stay in the southwest all year. This again, if you are um, a nerd like I am, and I'm, I'm sure some of you are, if you love these videos that you can find on Birds of the World using the eBird data. So if you watch the video, this is turkey vulture movement throughout the year. You can see where the and then, you know, March April they all go up and uh, spread up into North America, and then when we get to you know, October, November, right? There they all go, um, south south for the winter. And there are turkey vultures that are resident in South America uh, all year. And they do what, they seem to do what Keith Bildstein calls a reciprocal migration when the turkey vultures from North America come down for the winter. Some of the tropical turkey vultures head into the Southern cone of South America, uh, presumably to kind of get out of the way of the bigger birds from North America, which is pretty interesting. All right, so for the last couple minutes, I wanna talk about black vultures, which are in the news um, often for, you know, like whatever, ransacking villages and taking babies out of their strollers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and and they are really, really cool. I, I This is, I don't, I mean, this is probably, I don't wanna say this around, you know, Boris and Lou, but, this particular bird, his name is Maverick. He's probably my favorite bird at ACCA. Um, and he's a black vulture that was hit by a car. And his name is Maverick because he was hit by a car in the parking lot of a bar called Mavericks <laughs> um, here in, in Morgantown, West Virginia. And he can't fly well enough to return to the wild. But uh, black vultures, um, you know, like there's similar turkey, turkey vultures, they have a similar range. Uh, this, but they are not in the West in the same numbers that turkey vultures are, which is pretty interesting to me. They are really an Eastern North American species. They go up to about Phoenix, Arizona, uh, about San Antonio, um, Texas. You know, they don't, Central Texas is like the Western border sort of, and Arizona is kind of the, Phoenix, Arizona is sort of the Northern uh, edge of their range in the, in the, in the southwest. So I'm not entirely sure why that is. Uh, it's possible there was another subspecies or another species of black vulture that went extinct during the last ice age it, that that was a western black vulture and it's possible that um, maybe that's why they are not in the west because there was a similar species there but whatever the case they are an eastern eastern bird and a tropical bird. You'll notice on this map they don't move around as much as turkey vultures. They are not quite as migratory as turkey vultures. They might they might wander seasonally, but they don't do this 
or they don't seem to do this big migration like a lot of turkey vultures do. Uh, but they they are more tropical than turkey vultures. Uh, they are they're about 90% of black vultures live in Central and South America, and only about 10% um, live in North America. So this is another vulture comic that is not, it's, it's sort of funny, but it's not as funny as the others. You know, good news on the climate change bill, right? The oil lobbyists won. So one reason potentially that black vultures are, you know, maybe showing up further and further north, uh, it could be climate change. That's been one of the theories about um, why they're showing up further north as things get warmer. Um, birds that may have been concentrated more in, in the south, like the white ibis, um, or black vulture can kind of spread upward, northward a little bit. We also have highways that we didn't have a thousand years ago, you know, or even a hundred years ago. So these big interstate highways serve up all this food all the time. Um, and highways also uh, are often warm and the, the hot air rises off the highways and that provides a great place for the birds to soar and stay warm and also eat. So uh, there are a couple different, oh, and there's still another way, another reason that black vultures, um, you might be seeing them more. And it could be that they are sort of returning to an area where they haven't been seen in 100 or 200 years. Uh, and I've got an Audubon quote here coming up in a minute that um, sort of in John James Audubon's species account, he notes black vultures being further north than we are accustomed to seeing them. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So black vultures, even though they get they get blamed for all kinds of things, their diet is still exclusively carrion, but they make these you know headlines when they're reported to um, occasionally attack you know weak or dying animals. Uh, so this needs more study. Um, in some locations, it's reported that black vultures will attack, you know, calves that have been just born or lambs that have been just born. Um, but it's really tough to know if something was stillborn and black vultures ate it, or if, or if it was, uh, or if they ate it before it died, um, or what. It can be really, and of course, if you saw them trying, if you were witnessing them trying to eat something that wasn't dead. I mean, these are four pound birds, like it's not, they're not like dragons or monsters that are going to attack you if you shoo them away. Um, so it, but that all that being said, I mean, if the bird, if there's something on the ground that can't move, whether it's alive or dead, and they walk up to it and start to eat it, um, it certainly is certainly something that could happen. Uh, but it's it's um it's something that needs more study. Um, you know why does it happen in some areas and not others? Uh, placenta is really really good. I hear very tasty. And if you're a vulture that has a fairly weak beak, like a turkey vulture and a black vulture, um, a placenta just like a gut pile doesn't have any hide or fur to get through. It's just like an organ sitting there. And black vultures are smart and opportunistic and will learn where births are going to happen and they're going to wait for that placenta to come out so they can they can snatch it right up <laughs> so risk any real or perceived risk um, can be you know can be mitigated by keeping your pregnant or anything vulnerable in a barn or near a barn or near humans um, or dogs again black vultures are you know four pound birds um, and they also have feet, just like a turkey vulture. They have chicken feet. They can't carry anything in their feet. So if they are killing animals, it's animals that they walk up to and eat, <laughs> um, you know, while they're immobile. I have tried to sit very still um, in Maverick's enclosure <laughs> with him, and he hasn't tried to eat me yet. But maybe one day. This is, this is the long, I don't want to read all of this long quote, but this is from Audubon's Birds of America. So this is 18, written between 1827 and 1838. So, you know, 200, 200 years ago, essentially. He was noting that black vulture, the black vulture is a constant resident in all our Southern states. Far up the Mississippi, continues the whole year in Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, um, even in Ohio, as far as Cincinnati. And you know, it's, it's um, rarely seen further east than Maryland. So uh, 
if you read some of the news reports from Kentucky, though, and parts of West Virginia, everyone is like, oh my gosh, this non-native species is coming. We have to kill them all. When uh, black vulture numbers were probably a lot lower over the last 200 years, in part because we persecute, persecuted a lot of raptors, shot, you know, hawks, eagles, in addition to vultures. And black vultures and turkey vultures are also species that were negatively impacted by DDT, just like um, bald eagles and peregrine falcons and osprey. They're birds that nest on, on cliffs and caves. They don't build a nest. So if eggshells were weakened, they would crush them. So uh, anyway, it's, it's black vultures are about one of my favorite species. And, and I think they're fascinating and they're not as new as we think they are in this part of the country. This is um, a picture that I took in Mayaka State Park near Sarasota, Florida. I just watched these black vultures um, walk around and check all the grills for food. Like the big predator came in and, and, and had meat here and maybe left some. And there were about 10 other black vultures on the roof of a picnic shelter watching these two go around and check all the grills. <laughs> So this, if you're worried about dead mice, if you don't want to see dead mice, look away. But we have to give Maverick the black vulture a lot of enrichment because he is so curious and so smart and so um, interested in interacting with um, people and objects. And if you look at Wally's, he's um, holding the food in his little talons, but they're not, you can see there are, they look a lot like turkey feet. They don't have that big halix. You can see his little pinky, pinky halix in there just like a turkey vulture halix they they aren't equipped to carry stuff in their feet um they can hold things and tear chunks off like this like this poor dead mouse but but they're not they're not he doesn't really like the tails uh, but they're not not equipped for carrying anything in those those chicken feet so this this video i include i can't really explain this behavior you know why why um, our black vulture is obsessed with uh, plastic ball pit balls, but he will do this for, you know, hours. He will chase, chase ball pit balls around. Um, and he also will, we also give him a dish, dish of ball pit, pit balls and we hide little pieces of food inside it. So he has to kind of move them around to try to find the food, <laughs> but he's just, it's, um, it's just fascinating to watch him. This is, this is a, a dog, dog treat toy, a puzzle feeder. We thought, you know, certainly this will take the bird longer than five seconds to figure this out. This is the first time he's ever seen this. And it was, yeah, probably five seconds there. He got a piece out already. So, oh, and now he, now he knows the game. <laughs> Just um, a very, very smart, very inquisitive bird um, willing to interact with, with whatever we give him. And Interestingly, there's videos that people have sent me of black vultures playing or batting around like soccer balls that have been left on fields and uh, interacting with um, equipment on playgrounds. And of course, black vultures famously uh, tear rubber strips off windshield wipers and around, um, you know, around windows and cars. I don't know why they do it. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, it's it's a uh, it's been suggested that the rubber that's that they use in those in that uh, like molding I guess has some soy in it that might taste might be tasty and black vultures will eat things besides dead animals they will eat dog food cat food um, Maverick really likes watermelon um, and bananas. And they will, you know, they will get in your trash and eat whatever, eat whatever's in there if you don't have a tight fitting lid on your trash can. Uh, someone sent me a picture once um, that that showed uh, that showed a black vulture about about 20 black vultures um, on her porch railing. And she sent it to me and said, Katie, I know you like these birds, but uh, do they know something? You know, <laughs> are they here for me? Am I about to die? And we, we figured out that she feeds outdoor cats. And the outdoor, the vultures were eating the outdoor cat food. So anyway, okay, so wrapping up here, you know, people will say, oh, yes, Katie, I get vultures are important and they're amazing, you know, and they're sort of cute, but they scare me. 
And it's, it's a, I think it's mostly the, the, the fact that, you know, something waiting that might eat us when we die. It is unnerving to think about. And that says, if you can read it, wait up guys, here it is. Yep. We're good to go. He's an organ donor. <laughs> and it can be sort of scary when you see, uh, you know, 50 vultures roosting in a tree together. And you probably see this in October, November. And it's like, where did all these birds come from? neighborhoods freak out they're like oh my gosh we have to cut down all the trees we have to shoot paintballs at them like what will we do the vultures are coming and why it looks this way in october november is you suddenly have all those babies that have fledged you have both parents um, at a roost that that in the past you only had one parent so it the roost size has doubled plus every pair has two babies so your, your roost is a lot bigger once all these babies fledge and make it to the communal roost. And then, you know, in the, in the fall, they'll start dispersing, kind of moving, moving slowly further south as they look for warmer, warmer places to eat. Uh, and we mentioned this a little bit already, but, you know, they roost together in places that are warm, in places that have a lot of food and that are windy. So if you really hate, you know, the vultures around roosting together, I mean, there's got to be, it's got to be warm and windy. And if you can remove a perch um, or make it less windy or, or make it make the food less abundant somehow, I mean, you can stop vultures from roosting that way. But uh, roosts will serve as, serve as sort of vulture hotels more than actual homes. So uh, it's possible if you have 30 vultures in a tree in your yard and, you know, whatever, you shine a light on them or your sprinklers and you scare them away, uh, and then like two weeks later, they come back, but they probably aren't the same birds. They're probably different turkey vultures, especially if it's during the winter when they're moving around a lot. Uh, and of course they follow each other to food. And we mentioned that black vultures roost in those family groups. So fears people have, you know, do they attack people, right? Only if they're dead, right? I mean, as far as I know, I don't think there's been any, any cases of vultures attacking humans. They've eaten dead people a lot. Uh, that's often, not often, but sometimes how, you know, it's very sad, uh, bodies of hikers and stuff are found sometimes because of the vulture activity um, in the area. Uh, mostly, most vultures prefer to eat dead herbivores, um, deer and cattle, things like that. If you see a vulture eating a dead raccoon, it's probably a really hungry, a really hungry vulture. So this is my video to just sort of show everyone that um, that uh, black vultures don't attack children. Um, and in fact, the only birds that I let my kids interact with is this black vulture is Maverick because he's the only bird that I know is not going to bite them or hurt them and that he's not gonna talon them. And this is my daughter, uh, Cora. And she was actually named um, in part for a common raven, but also, um, in part for Corygyps atratus, which is the scientific name for black vulture. And she calls him her buddy and uh, she feeds him, you know, dead mice um, pretty often. And he, uh, you know, nicely takes them and eats them right next to her. So here they are, you know, here he is not attacking my child. <laughs> so uh, let's see. So other fears people have, you know, are they waiting for me to die? Uh, you know, probably no more often than they're waiting for anything to die. Uh, turkey vultures don't follow dying animals. Uh, that, if you can't read this, this says for some reason these new birds didn't seem as interested in William's birdseed. Um, they they don't follow dying animals or people. They, turkey vultures usually find things to eat that have been dead for at least a day because they use that sense of smell. But in the movies, there are often, you know, turkey vultures following something that's dying, um, but they, they don't do that. And people say these vultures look ugly and they look creepy, right? But that's, of course, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? And bald is beautiful. Um, you know, everything is beautiful to, to some, everything is beautiful to somebody, right? So if you find yourself, you know, crawling through the desert, dying of thirst, um, and you see vultures nearby, um, you should you should not worry too much. You should just keep calm and carry on. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. 
so that and that that is the end and i'm i am very happy uh to answer answer any questions any questions that you might have and that's this is lou um at an educational program by the way <laughs> i'm gonna 